tale that Steve is going to tell you today is an extraordinary tale, both for San Francisco, for California, and, and for the United States. It's, it is an amazing story. And it starts with uh, the total disrespect that the world has had for the resources around them. So um, I'll go back to the early 60s when uh, a woman named Kay Kerr, her husband was the president of the University of California, and from time to time she would have to go to the airport to pick up VIPs flying into San Francisco and bring them back to the university in Berkeley. And her mode of driving over to Berkeley was to say, oh, and, and oh, and look over here, so that they would avoid looking at the garbage dump that was being created in the bay. And this went on for some time, and she got together with some of her friends who were the wives of professors at the university, and uh, we are jointly going to remember, uh, Kay Kerr was the wife of the president. Uh, Esther Gulick was the wife of a professor. And Sylvia McLaughlin, and one, I think it was Sylvia's husband, was the uh, wife of a math professor. Uh, anyway, the three of them said, you know, we can't stand this. This is just awful to see our bay being absolutely destroyed by dumping, by fill. Um, San Francisco Bay was being filled so that it was becoming a river, not, not, not a bay as it has been. So anyway, to make the story short, so Steve has some time, um, <laughs> uh, they, they went to the legislature and uh, did not succeed for several attempts. But finally, they found a legislator that was sensitive to the issue. And his name was? Petrus. 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 Uh, McAteer, John McAteer, and uh, Petrus, Nick Petrus. Uh, they, they, they could see the point of this. And they got a piece of legislation passed, which created something called the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. And so it is very carefully named Conservation and Development. And, um, and, and it, is an, it, it is a miracle story. The first executive director was a man named Joe Bogovitz, who lives here in Mill Valley. And, uh, and, and the first chair was, I'm still and we're just having Mel, a terrible time, Mel because Lane. anybody can help Mel us. Lane. Mel Lay, of course, Mel wonderful Lane. Mel Lay. And the Joe <coughs> Mel Act, is phenomenal. They then went on from BCDC, and, uh, and several years later, like from 66 to 72, when Prop 20, and we'll talk more about that later, uh, was enacted to creating the California Coastal Commission. The Joe Mel Show went from the BCDC to the Coastal Act, and what these two men did was uh, Joe, very smart man, created rules. And so, of course, the development and the conservation communities were just, you know, toe-to-toe. -to -toe. So he created a rule book. He, had a, he created a bay plan, and out of that plan, uh, created rules for San Francisco Bay. And Mel Lane had all the hearings. And Mel Lane was a man of enormous charm. So he would chair these commission uh, hearings and he would give everybody time to speak, no matter what they said, how much they hated each other. They would all get a chance to speak so that people could communicate. And that's a huge skill to be able to communicate, even though you hate what the other person is saying. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and so Steve Goldbeck has been with BCBC. Uh, we, after Joe, uh, we had uh, uh, Will Travis and uh, and now we have, have Steve, is that, is that correct? Well, I'm the, I'm the chief deputy. Chief deputy. He's been with BCDC for many years, and uh, we absolutely rely on him. So he's going to tell you the story. Well, uh, the first rule of giving a presentation is never to apologize. 
But I'm going to apologize because uh, my son just got a back to school cold and gave it to me. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to see if my voice will hold out. I, I'm hoping it will. Uh, but what I want to do today is thank you all for coming here and spending some time today to learn more about the Bay and the beauty. I know that uh, you guys care about it deeply, and so do we at BCDC. And I'm going to tell you a little about, a bit about the past, present, and future of San Francisco Bay and some of the threats it faces and what we're doing uh, in response. And so, so we can move along because the questions are always more interesting than the presentation. Uh, I'm going to jump right in. So here we are at San Francisco Bay, the largest estuary on the west coast of the Americas. You probably already all know that. Uh, it's also one of the most urbanized estuaries in the world. And the San Francisco Bay is about a third of the size it was at the, uh, when we all got here, at the Gold Ranch. Back then, it was very bucolic, and then all the ships started showing up to go to the gold field. And as the sailors would re get regaled by the mines, excuse me, the uh, 49ers going to the fields, what would happen when they got there, they all jump ship and head up to find their fortune. And so that little cove of Yerba Buena Cove got filled in with these ships. And so, of course, people started using them. One of the first saloons was on this ship, I think also the first brig and the first hotel. After a while, they became decrepit, and they became filled in, and became the financial district of San Francisco. <laughs> That's when the filling started. It didn't stop. It just got more intense. This. Treasure Island, 1930s World Fair, 400 acres was filled in by pumping in mud and sand from San Francisco Bay. And the technology got stronger and stronger, and folks started making new real estate. Cities and counties started vying with each other to move uh, their land into the bay, and it, things were kind of getting out of hand. And at the end of the 50s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers did a study of economic development in the region and produced this map, which really kind of crystallized matters because it showed those areas in San Francisco Bay that were susceptible to be built for new real estate. And in so doing, they showed what would happen if this process continued out to its natural conclusion, which of course everyone thought of as historical necessity, historical reality, it's just destiny. That's what's going to happen. Well, the people around San Francisco Bay decided that that wasn't the destiny they wanted for our region. And the three ladies, as we like to call them, uh, started the Save San Francisco Bay movement. And they said, we don't want San Francisco Bay to turn into the San Francisco River. And at the time, they were just looked at as you know, these are the wives of the professor just dabbling in things. And in retrospect, what people say that they were too naive to know what they were doing was not politically possible. <laughs> so they went ahead and did it. So they started the Save San Francisco Bay movement, which took up steam over the years. And uh, a popular disc jockey at the time, Don Newer, no, not Don Newer, uh, Mm -hmm. Don Blue? Sherwood, sure, Don Sherwood. Sure, sure. Don Newworth used to work for me. Uh, actually helped push the movement on the, in his talk radio and really talk, this jockey. Picked up steam and finally in the mid-1960s, the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission was established. Here are the three, three ladies. And it was given the task of preparing a plan for managing San Francisco Bay and the power to give permits as to whether or not people could put fill in San Francisco Bay and for what uses. And the mandate was to minimize filling in the bay to the minimum that needs to be put in the bay. So that's for water-rated uses like ports, uh, actually airports because people thought that that would was safer to land over the water than over the land. Uh, marinas, 
water-related industry. Those are water area uses you can get permits for. Residential uses, no. And also to minimize, even if you can put a fill, to make it the minimum amount necessary needed for the project and to mitigate, which was a new term back then, mm -hmm. mitigate for the adverse impact of the Bay environment, which usually means taking out some fill someplace else to offset the impacts of the approved project. The second mandate they had was to increase public access to the shoreline. Back in 1965, there was about four miles of Bay shoreline that was open to the public for public access. And the Bay shore, shoreline, it depends on how you want to count it, it's probably infinite if you use fractal geometry, but it's, it's you know, on the order of 400, 500 miles. So that was the mandate. It was set up in 1965 as a study commission with this power, and in 1969 was made a permanent uh, agency. And by the way, the legislation was signed by Ronald Reagan. And it prepared the San Francisco Bay Plan, which contains the policies that the commission uses <coughs> to decide whether or not to give these permits or what kind of conditions to put on them. And I won't go into great detail on that, but uh, the permitting process is pretty rigorous, uh, and permits for the big projects go in front of the commission, which has 27 members. They uh, come from every county of the Bay Area. Uh, the cities from the four quadrants of the Bay also has uh, citizens that are appointed by the governor and also by the state legislature, and also has other state agencies. The Water Board has a representative uh, as does finance, for obvious reason. Uh, and also federal agencies, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency also has members. And so the idea was to reflect the region and to be a place where people could come to talk about the Bay, how to protect the Bay. It was thought to be unworkable, 27 members, and it has worked fabulously. Usually votes are unanimous, in part because one person, the governor, can't just influence the outcome. They, he only uh, appoints a few of the members. So when people get on DCDC, they start thinking about the Bay as the Bay, as opposed to pushing whoever appointed these agendas. So I'll be done. Through required mitigation for fill projects, the Bay is larger than when DCDC was established. We've gone from fighting over postage stamps of wetlands to large-scale restoration projects, like the Sonoma Bay Lands Project, Hamilton Wetlands, the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration. Mm -hmm. We've gone from four miles to over 100 miles of public access, and now you probably all know about the San Francisco Bay Trail. We're trying to get continuous public access around the entire bay. And, the, and one interesting side note is when we first started requiring this public access, it's pretty much unheard of around the country to require companies. At first they were very upset about it. Then we actually had when a hotel that isn't really close to the bay comes in and says we want to get a public access permit from you. We say, well, you don't need a permit from us. You're 100 feet back from the shoreline. Don't worry about it. They say, no, no, no. We want to get a permit because this is something we want to give at because it will attract better employees to come work for the agency. What about the economy? It was, it was said that the Save the Bay movement would, would really harm the region's economy. We have approved billions of dollars of productive investment. It is the Conservation and Development Commission, by the way. And so we've approved port projects new bridges, maybe that's some corrosion issues, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the Bay is prospering, the Bay region's economy. And in part, we think that's because people come to live around this beautiful place. So it's kind of shown that economic development and environmental protection are not antithetical. But now, <laughs> we have a new, new problem face. We, I think, and I, you know, I've, I've been there for a while, but the agency's been around since the mid-60s. I think it's done a good job of what it's needed to do. But now, in addition to 
trying to keep the bay from shrinking, we have a bay that is expanding due to global climate change, global warming, and sea level rise. I always like to show this slide, say, everybody thinks about sea level rise as something out in the future. You know, maybe I don't have to worry about it, maybe my kids do. This is not the future, this is the past. This is from the oldest operating tide gauge in the United States, right out by the Golden Gate Bridge. And so this is sea level. As you can see, over the last hundred years, it's risen a little over a half foot. Sea level is already rising. But with increasing emissions of greenhouse gases, it's going to start accelerating. So our agency, which does planning for San Francisco Bay, it has the Bay Plan, we have to keep it current. We did a study of the impacts of sea level rise on the bay. So we did what's called the vulnerability analysis, where you identify your planning area, the bay and the shoreline, existing challenges like bay fill or water pollution, projected impacts, in this case we looked at sea level rise, how sensitive is the system to those impacts, and can it ad adapt to them. And so what we found, that's all very technical planning, toggle camera planner. This is what we found. This is another map that got people's attention. So the dark, very dark green, of course, is existing bay. The lighter uh, blue, sorry, I'm colorblind. The lighter blue is sea level rise on San Francisco Bay. And this is not what's going to happen. It's what may happen. And it's a scenario, because we don't know how much greenhouse gases we're going to produce. We don't know how high sea level is going to rise. But we did analysis of 16 inches and 55 inches of sea level rise, which were kind of conservatively high estimates when we did this analysis about four years ago. And now they're starting to become mainline numbers. And what we found was over 280 square miles of the Bay shoreline vulnerable just with 16 inches, going up to over 330 square miles at 55 inches. So even at low levels of sea level rise, we find a lot of potential inundation. And that's because, of course, when we diked off the bay long ago and filled it, we only filled it high enough to get out of the, the tidal range. Nobody was thinking about sea level rise, so it's kind of like the bathtub effect. So we got some major infrastructure at risk. Uh, where that World's Fair was, was supposed to be San Francisco's airport for the clipper ships, but then it was taken over by the military in World War II, so the city built SFO. The lighter blue shows that it's vulnerable at just 16 inches of sea level rise. <coughs> so our usual uh, conclusion from this is fly Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, Oakland is also at risk at 16 feet as well. So it's, this one's kind of hard to see, but if you look on the margins here, a lot of these areas that are inundated, they're not just big buildings, they're people's homes. So we found uh, that over 250,000 people living in San Francisco Bay shoreline now are at risk of potential flooding. Silicon Valley is also at risk, right? This is the this is one of the big economic drivers of the region. Most of the internet giant's corporate campuses are down right along the shore of San Francisco Bay, like Google. So I like to say, what happens if you try to Google something and say, sorry, get back to you, we're underwater right now. <laughs> the Pacific Institute did a study based upon these maps, which, by the way, were prepared by the US Geological Survey for us, of what the cost would be just to replace all the things that might get wet. Over $60 billion. That doesn't include the lost time, productivity, and all the things that we're seeing right now with the Napa earthquake, along with the spill of wine. <laughs> so the bay's gonna do great, right? It's gonna get bigger. Well, the issue there is we fill, depending again on how you slice and dice, the majority of our historic tidal wetlands. <coughs> Maybe we have 20% left, I don't know what number you want to use, but um, 
The wetlands can keep up a sea level rise if there's enough sediments. But as sea level rise accelerates, it's going to be increasingly difficult. And by the way, sediment supply to the bay for things I won't go into, but it's a fun thing to talk about if you're interested, is going down, suspended sediment levels that would feed them. Also, many areas, like here, this is China Camp, but they're up against hardscape. It'd be hard for them to migrate upland. And of course, a lot of the wetlands are up against uh, 101 or uh, department stores or what have you. So the wetlands are at risk. So if that wasn't depressing enough, we also found, as a part of our analysis, that this isn't just the bathtubs rising 100 years from now. The bathtub is getting sploshed around by storms and king tides, the tidal ranges that happened every year. And we found that these impacts, the, as the bathtub rises, the flooding is going to get worse. And a lot of areas around the shoreline are already at risk of flooding. So to demonstrate this, we made a map that shows the 16-inch sea level rise map in blue. And we overlaid that on the 100-year floodplain, the one, year, one chance in a 100 of having a flood, which is basically how we look at what the floodplain is in this country. Found that they're the same map. So literally, today's flood is tomorrow's high tide. Now this is outside our permit jurisdiction. We, we stop up here, we at BCDC, but the delta is also at risk to sea level rise. Um, a lot of it has subsided. It was peat, which they diked off and uh, been farming it, and the peat basically is just evaporating into the air. Many of these islands are 20 to 40 feet below sea level today. <coughs> So they're, they're faced with a lot of challenges. There's a 60% chance of a catastrophic failure of the delta levees in the next 50 years. And that's really not thinking about sea level rise. So they have some real issues. I'm glad I work in the San Francisco Bay and not the delta. So what are we going to do about it? That's all very depressing, but we have to deal, right? And so what I find in talking to people is they usually take either a fight or flight approach. They're usually going to fight it. We're going to build those levees. We're going to protect everything because that's what we do. We're Americans, right? So you have to start thinking about what the costs of protecting the entire Bay shoreline and then where you're going to get all the dirt to make the levees that you would need to ring the Bay. The other thing people do is flight. It's like, let's get the hell out of Dodge. Let's just fall back and let the sea level rise. And maybe that's what we'll need to do. But there's a lot of areas like downtown San Francisco. There's areas where we already have uh, a lot of transit lines coming together. And to combat climate change by reducing less greenhouse gas is, is doing infill development next to transit. So maybe we need to think a little more richly about how we're going to address this. And maybe. We need to start thinking about living with water. <laughs> this is Venice. Yeah. Venice oh, oh, These people are shopping for dinner. Wow. So let's start thinking a little bit how we live around a rising bay. This is Hamburg, Germany. This is a new building that's been built to be resilient to coastal flooding by elevating. Of course, you have to take a boat to get to it, but it's still there. These are huge surge barriers in the Netherlands. These also are surge barriers that just roll out. And uh, they do a great job now. The, the Dutch have just realized with the new numbers for sea level rise that these things are going to be overwhelmed in about 40 years. So they're not the long-term solution. You can actually see these things from outer space. But the Dutch have been thinking about this a lot, and so we actually at PCDC partnered with the Dutch to look at our respective countries. See, the, the Bay Area is a country, right? <laughs> <laughs> and came up and, and compared and contrasted. I, again, I don't have time, I won't go into it in any great detail, but it was very interesting. One of the more most fundamental challenges we found that differed from how the Dutch are approaching sea level rise 
and, and planning for it than we do is the fact that they are they had flooding, they had a lot of people die in the 40s from flooding. So they have community water boards that do the planning. Everyone trusts them to do it. Here, we have a lot of private property owners who say, that's my property. You can't even tell me what to do with that property. So trying to come up with some kind of a planning for the shoreline is going to be a challenge that we have that they don't. What we came out of this, and again, this is a little technical, sorry, but I think it is interesting. We, we thought, started thinking about how we think about it more richly about what we do. And we realized that when you look at any given shoreline, there's areas of high economics and low natural uh, places like San Francisco Financial District. Not much in the way of wetlands there, but there's a lot of economic development. You can go to the other extreme where you have a lot of wetlands right out here and you don't have a lot of economic development, and then you have mixed models, right? Things that have some of both. Maybe when you start thinking about how to respond on those shorelines, you should be looking at them differently and saying what's there and what makes the most sense. Maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend billions of dollars to protect a dyke historic bay land. Maybe you should restore that place. Maybe downtown San Francisco we ought to protect. So, Therefore, we're thinking about different ways to look at how we respond to sea level rise in San Francisco Bay. How do we plan for a rising sea level? We've also been doing technical studies. This is a technical study uh, that Phyllis helped us get going on, involved in, and we uh, worked with uh, a bunch of folks, including USGS again, to look at wetlands and development in terms of sea level rise. So this is Corte Madera. Anybody live in Port Madera? Okay. <laughs> this is the wetlands. This is Port Madera at 16 inches. So you see it has a real challenge. So what we wanted to do was look at how the wetlands help protect the development. So what we did is we took bathymetry, we looked detailed bathymetry, model we made, numerical computer models, and then measured the wave energy coming in on the shoreline across winter storms, and measured how it attenuates the wave energy coming on shore. And so again, remember that the flooding is going to come during big storms. If you have a nice big wetland out there, it's going to knock down some of those waves. The levee built in the back can be much lower. So the, this idea is now called a, a sideways levee, or a horizontal levee, or a nature-based solution. And so what we started to say, what is the ecosystem value of these wetlands to protect the shoreline? In part because we want to start talking about flood control managers and say, wetlands are your friends, not your enemies. They can help you protect the shoreline. We also looked at the watershed, because this is not only a watershed, it's also a sediment shed that carries down sediments down to the bay. And those sediments are what can feed those wetlands to help them persist as sea level rises. But right now, most of those sediments are getting trapped in flood control channels and getting taken out and put in landfills. So we started looking at the sediment sources to the wetland and what the impediments were to the sediment feeding the system. The last thing we looked at is, what can we do to help the wetlands? What kind of interventions might we want to think about to help them deal with sea level rise, like a, maybe a, a, a breakwater off the shoreline, or uh, doing oyster uh, restoration, kind of things that will help the wetlands deal with sea level rise. And maybe feeding small amounts of dredge material to help provide more sediment. So there's some of the technical studies we're doing. So we need to bring it back to what we're going to do. And we realize we, don't, we still don't really know what to do. We have more technical information. So what, what we thought is, how do you do a regional plan? How do, you, how do you deal in this region to deal with sea level rise? So we decided to do a demonstration project to look at that. And so we picked a portion of the shoreline, the Alameda County and did the Adapting to Rising Tides project, where we started working with the local folks because we realized that all planning is local, right? 
you got local planning and zoning, and they're going to be the first line of defense. But how do you start working with them to bring them together so it isn't just each city and county? Because what if this city here does a great job and then they flood because the city next to them didn't do anything? So we work with them and we work with a whole lot of partners, uh, federal folks, U.S. Department of Transportation, NOAA's Coastal Services Center, which does uh, work for uh, coastal planning, the, the Regional Metropolitan Transportation Commission, Caltrans, uh, a bunch of folks. We all got together and we started thinking about what is the appropriate level for doing what kind of work. And what we tried to do is come up with adaptation measures. So that's the new buzzword. I don't know if how many of you are familiar with it. So how, what kind of measures do you use to adapt to a, a, a rising sea level and what's appropriate to do at what level? And I'm not, again, not going to go into it, but some of the things that we found are interesting is uh, the vulnerability assessment when we talked with uh, the Port of Oakland. They said, no worries. No worries. Our facilities are high enough. They're not going to be uh, inundated for 40 to 50 years. And oh, by the way, we upgrade our facilities about every 20 years. So we're good to go. But then when we looked at the intermodal rail that they used to get all those goods out, we found that it was underwater. This is a picture from Superstorm Sandy uh, showing a similar thing. So great to have a seaport, but if you can't get anything in or out, what good is it to you? So those are some of the vulnerabilities we found. We also found that it was difficult for some people to plan because in this example, the Port of Oakland is vulnerable to something that is owned by some and operated by people that they have utterly no control over, the railroads. So this is going to be a difficult thing to, to deal with, but this is what we need to start working together on as a region. So five minutes. So lastly, what have we been doing about it from BCDC other planning? We actually did uh, an amendment to our bay plan to upgrade it, to address rising sea level. <laughs> and we found that we got a lot of pushback. And it wasn't just from climate deniers saying, oh, there isn't any, there's no climate change, don't worry about it. Bay Area people are pretty sophisticated. What we found was a lot of the local folks were very upset. We had people, really, I, they were made nameless, but I mean, we had city council members calling up and saying, take down your maps. Take down your maps. They're upsetting people. <laughs> <laughs> And unring a bell. But a lot of the local folks were concerned that BCDC was going to come in and this was really just a power grab. And we, we realized in part that we had done a good job educating ourselves, but not a good job of educating the public about what we were doing. And I think that's a really important message as you guys go forward and do your work. And that's a lot of what Audubon does is, is, is citizen information. I think that is key to addressing this issue. Can you describe what's going on in that picture? <laughs> uh, this, at, we actually stole this picture. That this was against a, a big development that just shows citizens. I like pictures. I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> so we had three years of process. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's the question. I just wanted to, you know, the very first chart you showed, was it six inches of sea level rise in the last hundred years? Yes. Yeah. So can you just share, because it's running through my head as you go through this next thing, and yet the measurement you're using now is 16 inches. So how did you decide to use 16 as your measurement? Okay. Um, because that's like saying two and 233 years from now. <laughs> so can you explain that measurement? Yeah. What, do you, what needs to be made clear, I, I probably should have stated the time, is that as we put more greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, that signal is going to pick up. So it's a it's kind of a, you saw, it's kind of a straight line, but it's going to go up like this. Yeah, okay, so that's missing from the yes. other thing. And so, so it's going to accelerate. So are you suggesting that in the next 100 years it'll be 16 inches? So it was 6 inches, now it'll be 16. So we, what's the, we don't know. The best estimate right now from looking at various sources is 16 inches about mid-century, around 2050. Okay, so and 55 inches that. is a better number for the end of century, 2100. But the thing to remember is it isn't going to stop then. It doesn't kind of like that and then flatten out. It's going to keep going for hundreds, 
hundreds of years if we don't do something about it. Yeah, Matt, I'm just trying to. No, I, I know. We're trying to learn Great to advocate question. and the connection between the numbers. Great question. Apologize. I'll fix the thing to put that. Mm -hmm. I chopped out that that slide, but I, I'll put it back in. Does that assume so. no change in behavior? Yes. No. <laughs> Worse. Does it include population growth? No, it does not. Exactly. So there, there's many things it can do. So let me finish my talk and then we'll get to the question. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was a good clarifying question. So I like that. So anyway, so we went through a long pro process. We ended up actually um, bringing folks along and we had a unanimous adoption again by the commission with the support of the environmental community, the uh, business community, and local government. So, what did, we, what did we do? We now require any large project on the shoreline, not a little, you know, fix my boat dock kind of thing, big projects have to do the kind of vulnerability assessment we did for their project. And then they have to be resilient to sea level rise for the impacts they show. And here's the slide that shows some of the various estimates of sea level rise. So you can see it. And I go, ooh, takes off. And so what we require is, as you can see, right now all those lines going out to mid-century, they're kind of pretty tight. And then they get really wide as you go out towards end of the century. And this is also around 2050 is about how long people usually amortize projects. So what we decided is that what it made sense to do was to build to be resilient to middle century to actually put in whatever levees or protective devices, outboard wetlands, whatever, to actually be protective, and then plan for what you're going to do for end of century. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you leave room to build another levee or whatever you're going to do to be resilient, because it doesn't make sense to build for something we're not sure what it's going to be yet. But you got to be thinking about it, you got to be planning for it. This is the first time anywhere in the country anybody's requiring this to our knowledge. So we actually today have policies that require individual projects to be resilient to sea level rise. The problem is that doesn't really add up because, again, if, if one section of the shoreline gets a permit and, and is resilient and nobody else next to them got a permit, what good is that? So we realize that this is kind of a piecemeal approach. So the commission calls for a regional strategy to be prepared for the region for us to address this. And we, we said the regional strategy shouldn't be prepared just by us. It should be prepared by the region. And so we looked to something called the Joint Policy Committee, which is composed of our agency, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, Association of Bay Area Governments, and the Air Board, and said this group should do it because it more represents the entire region. And it took about six to eight months to a year, and, and finally that body called the JPC agreed to do that. So we are now working with them on preparing a regional strategy, uh, and we're starting out working with the Association of Area Government on a resilience uh, strategy that would address earthquakes, just like we just had one, sea level rise and extreme storms. What's so, the name of that? A JPG? JPC, Joint Policy Committee. Okay. And that's the one Bay Area plan? And that's... Well, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission Association of Area Government put forth the One Barrier Plan, and we're thinking that the, this resilience plan we're doing is going to be put into uh, the One Barrier Plan, but it isn't the same thing. We're, it's a separate thing we're doing, but it will be closely coordinated. For those of you who don't like that idea. Uh, so, that was just the Joint Policy Committee. So, that's the work we're doing. Now, it, it seems like it's going to be difficult, but I always like to close of going back to the three ladies and the map that started the whole thing. Back at the time, back in the day, it was seen that it was politically infeasible to do anything different and would be economically devastating. These three ladies proved them wrong. So I say that today, with all the better resources we have, we can address a rising bay and come up with a society that has better environmental quality, better social justice and equality, 
and a strong economy if we get if we come together and do the planning and do the hard work now. And with that, I would like to close. Uh, I ask you, do you think you can preserve the marshes without having these people change their rules? Um, that's an interesting. That's a, a a question that we have been grappling with, and. Um, it's interesting, some of the, the proposals to do these new levees and berms, it involves more fill than doing uh, something different. And our law requires people to do minimum fill. So the question is, do we need to change our law to address that issue uh, to, to, to come up with the right mix of policies that we'll use going forward for Rising Bay? On the other hand, we don't want to just throw that, oh, policy out the window because it's outdated and doesn't allow anybody to, to fill in the bay. So we actually have gotten a grant from, uh, from NOAA, federal grant, to look at this issue, look at our policies, and see how they, how they may need to be changed and whether there's a change needed in our law to, to address the topic. So I would say the jury is out. A lot of these projects and things we could do today, I believe, under existing policies, but my guess is that we'll need to change them in a way to, uh, to address an expanding bay. Um, what is the relationship now between BCGC on this matter and FEMA? Great question. Uh, Would you repeat the question? Yeah, so what's the relationship between our agents, the two acronyms? Uh, our agency, BCDC, which is a regional state agency, and FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency that deals with all kinds of disasters across the country. They're up there in Napa right now. But one of the big things they do is flood control, and they do flood control maps of who is uh, susceptible to flooding. And one of the problems with FEMA is they're a creature of the federal government, meaning a creature of Congress. Their maps don't reflect sea level rise. And if you've read what a lot of the congressional folks say, you know why. They still don't want to believe it exists. So, so that's difficult. But we've been working with, uh, with the folks in FEMA. Uh, I can tell you they all get it. And uh, we're trying to come up with way workarounds. For one thing, uh, when they do their flood mapping, if the local folks, the local entity wants to, they can also look at scenarios that include things like sea level rise. So we're going to start trying to work with them. And uh, a lot of the areas that are at risk of flooding, it's really a question of what storm scenario. So some of these areas are already at risk now to some of the flooding. Um, so I think we're going to get along. I think it's going to take some time. How about the back? Just tagging on to that last topic about FEMA and UCDC, I recently attended a, a presentation that was given by FEMA and Tiburon because of some uh, changes to their maps. Mm -hmm. And what, what I think is kind of important, and I didn't, I didn't really realize this, but the, the changes to the FEMA maps aren't driven at all by sea level rise. They're not, they're not right. based on any future forecasts. They're based on all the past. historic data. Mm -hmm. And so some people might say, well, why aren't they planning you know, for sea level rise? But then it kind of goes back to your point about the, the low-lying areas, the flood zone and the sea level rise. What is it? My talk with planners, which was more technical talk, often has uh, a rear view mirror, but I usually talk about the fact that they're trying to drive the car by looking in the rear view mirror, because they're just looking at the past and not the future. But I've taken that slide off because we're trying to work with FEMA, and just bashing them isn't helpful. So we're trying to come up with solutions. Yeah? Do you think other countries are doing a better job? Other countries. Um, you know, we've looked around the world and, and around the country and around the world and have not found, oh, they're doing it right. The, the best folks are the Dutch yeah. in terms of having thought about this a lot and doing it for a long period of time. Now, in the past, they had a real bias towards engineered solutions, as I showed you. But they're, and part of the reason they came to us is the very has a reputation of doing restoration and design with nature. 
and they've decided they need to start going more that way. Uh, Room for the River is one of the big projects. Flood control project is a lot like the Napa flood control project up here where you're expanding the floodplain again. So I would probably say the Dutch. Other than that, the English <coughs> Brits are doing uh, some good coastal mapping and some good analysis, technical analysis. I haven't really seen much in the way of policy yet. So. Steve, you're a geopolitist. Right. Actually, I'm a planner, but I have a, science, a strong science background, right. but I'm not a geomorphologist. Well, you brought up a, a really an interesting kind of problem when you said that the bay is becoming sediment deficient. I didn't say deficient, but yes. Well, not quite deficient, but yes. it's not carrying as much sediment. Right, it's not carrying as much sediment. Uh, so you suggested you should have done a map of the Cordillera Creek watershed and said, you know, perhaps there's some sources of sediment here. Of course, what we're, we, we've been working on, you know, for for years and years is to reduce sources of sediment in order to protect fish habitat. So you've raised an interesting kind of conflict here. Where are the new sources of sediment? Just from, they're not coming from the delta as much as they have over the past decade. So, 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 so where's that sediment going to come from and how do we balance these two problems? That's correct. And, and in no way am I suggesting that we should be uh, having more erosion in order to get more sediments into the bay. Um, but remember what I talked about was how do we treat the sediment that is coming down? Because a natural system has sediment coming down. And what we don't want to do is trap it in these flood control channels that, you know, the old trapezoidal channel, and sediment would just fill in and then they have to clean it out and they put it up on land. So they're interrupting the natural system. So that's what we're, we're more about finding ways to reconnect the system and, and we can't just go back to how the system used to be, we're all here now and the system is changing, but let's look at how the system functions naturally and try to design the future. Okay, I'm gonna take a few more and then I'm gonna have to go because unfortunately I have to get on a phone call. Um, so, yes. Isn't one of the problems with sediment coming into the bay that this a lot of the sediment that does come into the bay has uh, pesticides, uh, antibiotics, plastics, all kinds of poisons in the sediment that are coming into the bay? Yes, um, and that's a whole other talk I could give on uh, dredging and the long-term management strategy and regional sediment management, uh, and that's something I was something I did primarily for years before I got into more of the sea level rise end. Uh, the good news is much of the bay sediments are, are very clean. Uh, everything's relative, of course, and everything has enriched levels of certain contaminants. But when we did biological testing and now require every project that dredges the bay to test the material for contaminants using uh, bioassays where they actually test it on organisms, we find only six or seven percent uh, fails testing to put it back in the bay. So the most areas have a low level of contamination, but all the things you talked about are things we need to be addressing. Um, and there's a lot of contaminants, of, they call contaminants of emerging concerns, like um, a lot of the new chemicals we're using, people don't even know what the effects are. So I could go on that for a long time. So that is a real problem, but there's a lot of sediment out there uh, that is very clean. Are we better in the Bay Area in that regard than, better than, than other parts, you know, other watershed, urban watersheds? Yeah, I, I used to have the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers come back, come out and say, you know, you guys, you know, we, we deal with black mayonnaise. Your contaminated material is our clean material back here in Texas or wherever. So yes, we're, we're doing pretty good. <laughs>